to a familiar passage, Hebrews chapter 12, and I just couldn't leave you hanging there at the end of chapter 11 of Hebrews because this uh, 11 actually spills over into chapter 12 and the thought doesn't end to Hebrews chapter 12. So we'll revisit this passage together and we will conclude our series on the power of faith in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 1, please. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. May the Lord rich blessing be to his word and may be sanctified in our hearts. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you again for what has already been experienced this morning, the songs of the choir, the praise of the saints, the, the testimonies, the gifts that have been offered, and the words that have been shared. Thank you, Lord. We bless you for this time when we come together around the word of the Lord. It's an exercise in futility, Lord, if you do not speak in and through us, if you do not open the eye of understanding of your people to receive the wonderful, majestic truth of the word of the Lord. So speak a good word to us today so that men and women and boys and girls might be encouraged to press on. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> and as I said earlier, we're going to continue and wrap up our thoughts this morning from this series that we've been on with the overarching theme of the, the power of faith in Jesus Christ. The power of faith in Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to talk specifically about the power and passion of vision to empower us to press on. The power and the passion of vision that empowers us uh, to press on. There's a lot written about vision a lot of training sessions in this day and era in which we live about vision. And the Bible has something to say about vision. The writer of Proverbs says, where there is no vision, uh, the people perish. And the word that is used there for vision in the Hebrew text, it describes the ability to see that which is not yet in full and complete view. It's so where there's no vision, where there's not an ability to see that which is not yet in full view. Then he says the people perish. And the word that he uses there for perish may have not been the best translation. Because the word in the Hebrew text, it describes the casting off of restraints. It says where there's no vision, where there is no ability to see things that's not yet coming into view, then people cast off all restraints. And so when people cast off restraints, that's why they perish. They perish by casting off the restraints that's helping them to maintain a disciplined, focused, chaste lifestyle. And so when restraints are cast off, uh, the people perish, according to Proverbs 11:28, Where there's no vision, the people perish. So when we look at our society today, we can see uh, how that is applicable. And we can see that's really being lived out. Is that if people don't believe that things are going to get better tomorrow, next week, or next year, then they won't exercise the discipline that they need to exercise today, to do things they need to do today so that when tomorrow, next week, next year, five or ten years from now, comes that they're in a better position because they position themselves and made the proper decisions in the present. 
So there is a lack of vision among many young people today. A lack of a, a, of a compelling idea that causes them to be willing to make the right choices today, to exercise the discipline today, to defer gratification today because I want to take advantage of that which is going to be there in the future when I get there. And so one of the challenges for the church is to try to cast a vision that is compelling enough that would engage young people, middle-aged people, and older people to make sacrifices today, to make sacrifices of their time, to make sacrifices of their talent, to make sacrifices of their treasure, to give themselves to something because they believe that there's something better that's going to emerge in the future. And they're willing to give themselves in the present for the benefit of the future. We must embrace that type of vision for our own lives personally, for our children and for our grandchildren, that we must be willing to make sacrifices today of our time, of our talent, and our treasure. And I think that's going to be the challenge for the church in the 21st century. The challenge for the church in the 21st century is a challenge of time. Because time is one of the major currencies of the 21st century. Because most people basically have already scheduled their calendars with a plethora of activities, and there's very little time left for them to give time to the work of the local church. Amen, like, amen, Deacon Mitchell. <laughs> there's very little time left. That people think that they come to church on Sunday morning, and I'm glad to see you, but that's not enough. If the only commitment of your time that you give to the local church is arriving on Sunday morning, then you actually are taking more than you're giving. Because you come because you have a need to come. You're pulled to come. Your soul is tired. You're weary. You need instruction. You need encouragement. You need to be in the worship ambiance and atmosphere, and that's important. We should be drawn to come to church and be in the environment where the Word of God is preached, where prayers are being offered and lifted, where music has been sung live by people that we know and love and respect. And so we need the worship is important, and worship services are important, and we ought to be here. Matter of fact, I wasn't in church last Sunday, and my wife can tell you that our lives for the last 31 years basically has uh, been centered around church. And there's been few Sundays in 31 years that I haven't been in church. And there's been few Sundays in the last 17, 18 years I haven't been here. Because there's something about my body clock and the need that I have to be with people that I know and with people that I love in that atmosphere, in that environment that recharges my soul on a weekly basis and helps to calibrate my life and give me a renewed energy to press on even when the spiritual fatigue and weariness is setting in. Church attendance is important, and I'm amazed that so many people take it with such a cavalier attitude. It's really, it's really important. It's more important for us than what we even realize. But church service is also important because church service, it reminds me that I have been gifted by God, I have been privileged by God, I've been entrusted by God with some stewardship gift, with some ability or talent that wasn't given to me for myself, but was given to me that I might give it away so that other people's lives could be spiritually and emotionally enriched and they could be encouraged and uplifted. And in so doing that, I have a sense of value and worth because I'm giving myself to something and to people that are important. Time is going to be the current of the 21st century. Whether or not people are willing to readjust their schedules and make available time to be in church, be in Sunday school sometimes, show up for prayer meeting every now and then just to let the preacher know you know where the church is on Wednesday night. Y'all can laugh about that. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at nobody. The guy called on the radio this morning, jumped all over me. Sister Foster heard. I ain't mad at nobody. I've been fighting for him for the last several weeks, and they don't even realize it. He called and fussed at me because I'm the only person that will listen to him on Sunday morning. And I'm trying to get out of there, and he don't realize he's fussing me. I'd have met with the Secretary of Military Affairs and Public Safety this past week to try to talk about the work release center on the east end of Charleston. I met with the Commissioner of the Department of Correction on three occasions to try to talk to him about it. Wrote a two-page letter to the governor asking to give 
for him to give some attention to it, but he called and argued at me and the rest of the ministers. I just can't take no more. <laughs> I just can't take no more. Then his wife in the background called me a liar. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I'm a grown man. I'm almost 56 years old. I ain't got to tell no lie. I'm telling you the truth. A court injunction was filed to try to stop the work release center. Judge uh, Kaufman, a good friend of mine, basically said there was no basis or no merit to stop them from buying the building. We've been to court. And he's talking about the minister, y'all ain't did nothing. And I let him go for three or four minutes, and I say, well, can I say something? And finally I said, look, you got to listen to what I'm trying to tell you here. Here's my point. The challenge is people don't really understand how hard it is to do, get anything done that's right and fair and that's just. Everything is a challenge. Everything is a struggle. Everything is a fight. And at the church of all places, we have lost this idea that we are in a titanic struggle to make spiritual progress. And so many churches have come to the conclusion to think we can come and sing a few songs and stir the choir and shout a little bit and make a bunch of noise, and that's going to cause the devil to flee. No, it's not going to cause him to flee. As soon as you finish, he's going to say, is that all you got? And so the challenge is going to be, are we prepared to calibrate our lives so that we can become a part of God's army so that we can be prepared and ready to respond to the issues and challenges that the Holy Spirit needs us to respond to in real time, as I shared with you before, so that society can see that the church does have power. And one thing we have is courage to try to stand up for what's right, to try to speak to issues from a biblical perspective in the name of the Lord, and to try to represent the best interest of the least, the last, the left out, the lost, and the left behind, even when they call you and fuss at you. Because you do right, not because it's easy, but because it's right. And because God is always pleased when we try to do what is right, even when it's not easy and when it's not comfortable. And so our challenge is going to be, are we willing to prioritize our lives and our schedules to say, I'm going to give at least an hour a week. I don't think that's too much to ask for. At least one hour a week in some way of service to the local church where I am fed, where I am nurtured, where I am encouraged, and where I am strengthened to go on in the name of the Lord. All right, I'm through. I'm going to move on now. I didn't, I'm getting old now. It's hard for me to to fight these battles by myself. So the writer of Hebrews basically is trying to challenge the Christians of his day to gird themselves up for this struggle, that it was not going to get easy, that living for Christ would not get easy as you got older, that living for the Lord would not get easy as time passed. As a matter of fact, it will get increasingly more difficult as the enemy puts up more opposition because we might not believe it, but the devil knows that his end is drawing near. And as his end and his time for destruction draws near, he will try to create more havoc and try to create more dysfunction and more chaos to try to discourage more Christians that we might lose our effectiveness for the Lord Jesus Christ and just say, well, I'm just going to wait till the Lord come back. No, I'm going to fight till he come back. I'm going to fight sin. I'm going to fight the devil, I'm going to fight wrong, and that Jesus comes back. Because I think that's what he expects us to do. So the writer of Hebrews, as he brings this thought to a conclusion about the power of faith in Jesus Christ, and he's chronicled to them from their history, starting in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It wasn't an exhaustive chronicling, but he raised people up to remind them of the stock that they had come from. That they came from a strong and a rich spiritual stock. And he reminded them of a young man by the name of Abel, the second son born to Adam and Eve. Now Abel had been murdered, brutally murdered by his own brother Cain. But our Abel's life was so regal and so righteous that his blood cried out from the ground to where it got God's attention. And God had to respond. He reminded him of Enoch, a man of faith who walked with God, and God loved Enoch's fellowship so much that one day Enoch went for a walk, and he just walked on to heaven. He reminded him of a man by the name of Noah, a preacher of righteousness, 
who found favor and grace in the eyes of the Lord. And a man who preached for 120 years and didn't have but six converts. That's it, to his credit. But the Bible says he was seven. He received the record that he was righteous. His wife, well, she really wasn't a convert. She was almost a convert. If you read the story very closely, uh, Noah's wife, she almost got there. But my point is this, is that he didn't have great success from an earthly material standpoint, but the fact that he had a witness and a testimony, and he had sons that carried on his work. And then he goes through the line of other people, to Abraham and to Sarah. And then we saw last week when he talked about those who wandered around in sheepskins and in goatskins and were destitute and that didn't have anything and didn't receive the promise and some were sawn in two and some were beheaded, but they held on to their faith. So with that as a, as a backdrop, he says, therefore, he said, therefore goes all the way back to chapter 11, therefore, therefore, since we also are encompassed about, we are encircled by such a great cloud of witnesses. So the first thing he resurrects and he presents to them is the examples of those who've lived before. The examples. There have been other people who've lived through hardship and difficulty and pain who maintained their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My own soul was stirred this morning as I was talking to my wife and I got on a conversation. I went around through the history of the genealogy of my brothers and my sisters. But in so doing it, it reminded me of where I had come from. And it reminded me of my grandmother, Ollie Mae Wilson Clark, and how many names she had because she was a gypsy. She had a bunch of them. But it reminded me of this little old prayer ward woman who was about five, four foot, ten inches tall, who was married at the age of 14, had four children, but by the time she was 19, during the Great Depression. And then when, when we came along and my mother had the seven of us out of wedlock, my grandmother basically took up responsibility to help my mother raise us. And I was reminded of the sacrifice that she made. And I can still see her right now, all four foot ten inches of her. As a matter of fact, I got in my basement to this day, I got a washboard. And most women don't even know what a washboard is. But I got a washboard in my basement in honor to my grandmother because my grandmama had a washboard, not a washing machine. And she scrubbed our clothes on a washboard with her arthritic hands, and she would then hang them out on the line because there wasn't a such thing in my neighborhood as a clothes dryer. And there were all kind of lines drawn through the house that she would hang clothes up. And I can see her now out there in sub-below zero weather taking in those frozen clothes off the clothesline and bringing them into the house and then stringing them into the house so that our clothes could be clean. I'm reminded of that. That's where I come from. And someone thought enough of me to sacrifice enough so I would have clean clothes to wear because they thought I could have a future. And I can see her now walking the hillsides of McDonald Hill, picking wild greens and picking poke salad. I can see her up on a ladder picking berries out of a tree so she could can fruits and vegetables in her little garden so we would have healthy food during the wintertime. Somebody thought enough. That's what I'm talking about. There's an example of somebody who had some faith, who had the faith to believe that if she made sacrifices during her lifetime, that her sacrifices would result in her grandchildren be inspired to have a better life than what she thought she could have. Are y'all listening to me? And didn't want nothing. My grandmother didn't want nothing in life but for her grandchildren to be healthy and for her grandchildren to do well. My mama didn't want nothing out of life but for her children to do well and they made every sacrifice possible. The examples of people that have gone before and who live lives of personal sacrifice because they had a vision that someone else would be able to realize a blessing because I sacrificed during my lifetime. The Chinese has a proverb that says, one man will plant the tree, but the next generation will enjoy the shade. We got to have a vision. We got to have a vision that we are part of something that is bigger than we are, that is larger than we are, that has culminated on us that we stand where we stand because there were some people who had some faith. Somebody somewhere loved God, believed in God. Somebody prayed, 
that this generation of young people would have an opportunity to do things they thought they never could do. And what we got to do is to seize the moment, to seize the opportunity to realize that this is no dress rehearsal, ladies and gentlemen. This is the real deal. This is the final show. And if we're going to serve him, we better serve him now. I, I, I'm trying to warn you. I'm in that gener I'm time in my own life. I'm seeing my mama and I'm seeing my daddy's generation die. And I'm becoming the old person I used to look at. And so I went back home on yesterday, Mr. Richard Warren, one of the, one of the strongest men in my neighborhood, a little old short man, and during the time of integration, when they integrated schools after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, what integration resulted in was many black teachers were displaced. They closed the schools, shut down the black schools, and many black teachers had to go wherever they could find a job. And Mr. Warren was sent to Golly Bridge of all places, Golly Bridge, West Virginia. There wasn't no black folk in Golly Bridge going to school. And he went to Golly Bridge, but he was a, such a superior musician, he won the hearts of the people of Golly Bridge, and they embraced him as one of their own, and they never would let him leave. It was after 40 years of being a band director at Golly Bridge High School. And yesterday in little old Mount Hope, West Virginia, a parade of white folk from Golly Bridge, West Virginia, came all the way to Mount Hope to pay their final respects to little old five feet Richard Warren, who was a band director for 40 years. And Richard Warren, who was the first black they ever let be in the, the, the Mount Hope Lions Club. And they let him in because he's the most gifted musician in the neighborhood. And his gift took him to a place that none of the rest of us could go to. All those people in the Lions Club, they all came. They all crying and weeping. Oh, Mr. Warren, he, we loved him so much. He was so dear to us. We got people like that. And all of us who've had been touched by people's lives like that, who gave, who gave, there are people in my little neighborhood. I wish y'all could have grew up in my neighborhood because I feel that I've underachieved because the smartest people in West Virginia, someone was in Mount Hope, West Virginia, and they would not leave. They stayed right there. In that neighborhood, Gladys Wheeler, Marion Anderson, Ailey's Watkins, Tom Ash, these people were premier educators. Eunice Fleming was one of the most brilliant musicians this state has ever produced. She graduated, listen to me, she graduated from Blue Steel State University at age 19. Graduated. Secured two master's degrees and came back and wouldn't leave Mount Hope, West Virginia stayed right there and she gave her life to educating the children. She's 85 years old and she's still substitute teaching because she had a vision that things were going to change. And if things did change, they were committed to making sure that all those little black nappyhead kids in Mount Hope, W.E. Du Bois Elementary School, would be ready to compete at the highest academic level because they had given everything they had to give. The examples of people who had faith. And I tell you right now, when I go back home, I am almost embarrassed when I go back the way they treat me. It's almost like I'm royalty. And when my sister come back in town, it's almost like somebody royal coming back to the neighborhood. Because they look at us as being a result of what they were able to do. And there are many others. And they love us dearly. And they love us sacrificially because they know they sacrificed and we at least took advantage of some of the opportunity they created. Oh, y'all listen to me. Are we getting ready to move into this generation and they all are dying off now. I went home yesterday and as I was coming into my stepmother's house, she's 94 years old and she's still the Mount Hope Post Carol Register Gazette. She know more about what's going on in Charleston than I do. And every time I show up, she says, me, she says boy, y'all crazy down in Charleston. And she started reciting all the news. It's when you're 94, you ain't got to do it. Read the newspaper and watch the news and wait for time to pass. But she would tell me all the things that's happening in Charleston, West Virginia, something that I didn't even know about. But she said, I got some bad news for you. She said, your, your daddy's youngest sister, she just died. She just died the day before. She had a heart attack driving a car there on the highway in Delaware. And she pulled off to the side and called the police, they called the paramedics. Unfortunately, she died before she, they got to the hospital. And I was just thinking, that's another one of that generation. One by one, they're moving off the scene. And rapidly, my generation, we're becoming the old people. We're becoming the last line of defense. 
and it won't be too long and some of us will be the example that other people are looking for. Are you listening to me? I, I shared with a friend of mine the other day, I said the problem with some people, some, some elite intellectual blacks, is they spend too much time studying history and, and doing plays about history. When are we going to make some history? Things are as bad as they've ever been. It's time for some of us to decide we're going to be a part of changing the trajectory of what's happening with our people and our neighborhoods and our community, and we're going to make the sacrifices in the name of the Lord to try to turn our children back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wrote an article this past week. Some of my stuff now, they said it's getting too little. They won't even put it in the paper. But this one, I kind of toned it down, you know. And basically what I said, I said, everybody got excited about our Landau Murphy when he won Who's Got Talent. We were all proud of him, and rightfully so. But I said, the boy was already my hero, already my hero when I found out that he had one wife and four kids, and he's willing to wash and detail cars to take care of his children. I don't care if he can't sing a note in a bucket. He already my hero. In fact, he's trying to take care of his wife and take care of his children. And out there in California, I saw him the night on the TV. He got his wife right there. He got sense of no, I ain't got no business in Las Vegas without my wife. He got her right there beside him. And I just got a million dollars too? Oh, no. And I asked him, well, lying down, what have you bought? He said, nothing but a pair of Air Jordans. I ain't bought nothing else yet. He said, the first thing I'm going to do is build my wife a house. The second thing I'm going to do is going to put some money beside for my kids' education. But I ain't did, spent a dime yet, but bought me some new tennis shoes. And if you look at his clothes and his latest hair, you can see he ain't spent no money yet. <laughs> he ain't spent no money yet. He understands he got to keep his priorities straight. And so he becomes, and I wrote this article. I wrote this article. Here's a young guy who got the new school look of the braided hair and the cornrows and the baggy clothes. He got the new school look, but he got an old school choice of music, Ellington and Count Basie and Ben Crosby and Frank Sinatra and my main man from Motown, Marvin Gaye. I knew he was all right. When I saw him on TV and I saw him in uh, LaBelle singing, Patty LaBelle singing uh, Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell song, I knew he was going to win. I knew he was going to win because ain't nobody like Marvin, man. And my point is, I said, he got the new school look, but he got the old school choice of music. He has the old school choice of values, of marriage, of fidelity and the family. And we need to lift him and his wife up. I'm going to see him when he comes here to the place, and we're to pack the place out. Lift him and his wife up. Say, here is the prototype of what we're trying to produce. Young people who try to keep their marriage and family together through the good and through the bad. And he becomes a modern-day example for us to point our young people to. Brother, many of these entertainers and actors and stars, don't get me started on the Kardashians. I ain't going to start that. They're just going to make a total mockery of the institution of marriage. Getting married for money, stay married for 72 days and make $17 million. There ought to be a law against it, but it isn't. Just going to make a mockery of the institution of marriage. Live, on TV, with everybody watching. And everybody think that's cute. That's not cute. That's sacrilegious. You wouldn't commit no marriage. And don't, don't, even, don't even make a mockery of the institution. Just go on and do what you're going to do. They'll pay for it. Well, let me wrap this up. We got to do communion this morning. We so said, we all got these examples around us. We got these examples around us. Here at the Grace Bible Church, we got examples around us. We got Papa Ben Tolliver Sr. and his wife, they're around us, who had great vision, and he would pray for you wherever he saw you, witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in the thoroughfare of life. They're the examples around us. We got Mother Mary Tolliver, godly woman who supported Brother Ben and helped found and establish this church. She's a witness, and her memory and her legacy still encircles this church. It's around us. We got Sister Gertrude Cunningham, a quiet prayer warrior who never raised no whole lot of sense, but faithfully gave and faithfully supported this work and this ministry. There are examples of people that have sacrificed and that have served so that we can have this opportunity today. I just don't want to waste it. Lest their sacrifice be viewed as being in vain. Well, that's the examples, the great cloud of witnesses, and we all got them in our own lives. Cloud of witnesses. Pastor Talbot talks about his grandfather, godly man, part of the cloud of witnesses. Deacon Mitchell's father, uh, Reverend James Mitchell Sr., a great source of encouragement to me. I never will forget a sermon he preached about Moses. What did you got in your hand? 
When it's, and every time I read the story about Moses, I can hear Reverend Mitchell preaching that sermon. What have you got in your hand? Use what you got in your hand. There's a great cloud of witnesses. But he said, secondly, there are encumbrances to us running. There's weights. There's the weight of doubt. There's the weight of unbelief. There's the weight of, 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 of putting things off, procrastinating. There is the weight of being paralyzed by the failures of our past. There's the weight of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty. You can talk yourself out about just anything, anything you want to talk yourself out of. If you look at all the things that could go wrong. As a matter of fact, if you, if you went through all the things that could have gone wrong, then you wouldn't have got out to bed this morning. If you get up out the bed, you might slip on the floor and hit your head. If you go in the bathroom, you might stumble over the towel and hit the commode and hit your head. If you get in the tub, you might fall getting out the tub and hitting your head. If you finally get dressed and make it to your car, you might get run over, run into by somebody and hit your head. A whole bunch of stuff could have happened, and you could have talked yourself out of getting up. But you got up because we can't stay in the bed all day and make progress. And so we got to lay aside what the weight is, the fear, the doubt, the uncertainty that ensnares us, that holds us back. And then we have to run. The exhortation, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And all of us who live in this place that we call the world, there's a race that is set before us. There are obstacles that we got to deal with. There are challenges that we must overcome. There are hurdles that we must stride over. We all have a race that is set before us. And it's past time for us to realize we have got to run this race. We have got to run this race. And sometimes the thing that is the most obstinate, the thing that causes you the most discomfort, is the thing that God is using to energize you, to keep pressing, to develop the type of spiritual muscle and tenacity and determination that you need to get to where God is trying to get you. We got to run this race. We got to run this race, and we got to run it on purpose. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He says, I beat my body under subjection, Paul says. I bring myself under control, Paul says, because I want to run the race, and I want to win, and I don't want to be disqualified. Well, as I close, he said we got to run it with endurance. You see, the King James says patience, but endurance is a better translation in the Greek text is hupomene. And endurance carries the idea that I got a weight on me. I got, I got a backpack I got to cover. I, I got something I got to bear, and I can't fall. I can't allow myself to be overcome by the burden. I got to keep pressing on. I got to keep pulling forward. I got to keep moving forward. I got to run with endurance. Even when the spiritual monkey gets on my back, I can't quit. I got to keep running with endurance. And then finally, what is the encouragement to run? I love my mama, and I hope to see her one day. I love my grandmother, and I hope to see her one day. I love my brother, and I hope to see him one day. I love my brother, I love them all, I hope to see him one day. But my encouragement to run is that I'm looking under Jesus, the trailblazer, the author, and the finisher of my faith. I'm looking to the one who walked across the Via Della Rosa up a mountain called Calvary and was crucified on a hill called the skull. I'm looking for that one who hung there, who bled, who dropped his head and his shoulders and cried to tell us that it's finished, it is accomplished. I'm looking under Jesus, the one they took down off of the cross and placed him in a borrowed tomb. I'm looking under Jesus. The one who was raised from the dead on the third day by the power of Almighty God. I'm looking unto him. The one who says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye shall be also. I am looking unto Jesus. I don't care where else you look. The circumstances of life, the situations of life, the pressures of life, the financial stress of life, it will wear you out unless you look under Jesus. 
If you look unto him, he will lift your tired, weary spirit. If you look unto him, he will lift your dehydrated soul. If you look unto him, he will energize you by the Holy Spirit, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. But what did he do for me? Look at what he says in the text. He says, for the joy that was set before him. See, that's what, that's how you get vision. You get vision by putting something on the other side of the struggle. So Jesus knew he had to go to the cross. He knew that he had to be crucified and buried. But he looked beyond the cross and he looked beyond the tomb and he looked to the joy that was set before him. And the joy was that all wretched, vile sinners like you and me, we could be saved. The joy beyond the cross is what he looked to. And so he looked beyond the present frustration and pain and difficulty and say, it's worth doing it all for what's on the other side. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying if you look unto him, he will show you something on the other side. And you will see something that will motivate you to want to continue to do what it is he would have you to do even when everything inside of you causes you to want to quit. He says, looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He bore up under the burden of the cross. He despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, for consider him who has endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You know what's wrong with the church today? We've forgotten how much he paid. We've forgotten how much he paid. We have forgotten that heaven had to liquidate all of its spiritual assets for us to be saved. We have forgotten that God had to give everything that was precious and near and dear to him. He has invested in us and our salvation. We've lived just long enough to find enough people that were worse than what we are, and we now think we're better because we didn't find somebody else worse than what we are. And we fail to realize the price that he paid. And so we don't live our lives anymore with a sense of perpetual obligation and indebtedness to the Lord saying, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do? What is it you would have me to do? He endured the cross, he says. He despised the shame. He didn't allow the shame to cause him to shirk away from what he had to do that we might be saved. And then he closes by saying, now, you better consider him. As you know in your Bible, the him is capitalized. He said, you better consider him. In every decision that we make, we should consider how does this reflect my love and my devotion and my appreciation to Jesus Christ. We are to consider him. If we consider him, then when we are preparing to write our tithe and our offering, we're not going to figure out well, how little amount can I get. We're going to try to say, well, how much do I really need to keep? Because I'm considering the price that he paid for me. When we consider him, when the invitation is extended that I need, the Sunday school teachers, I need bus drivers, I need, well, if we consider him, we don't start to say, well, the Lord has not led me to do that yet. Let me ask you a question. Let me be honest with yourself. How many times have the Lord led you to go to the mall? <laughs> How many times have the Lord led you to buy a big T-bone steak? How many times have the Lord led you to get a big apple pie a la mode after you ate the big T-bone steak? The Lord didn't need to lead you to do that, right? So there's some things that I know I just should do because it needs to be done. And if I do what needs to be done, if I keep doing it long enough, the Lord will lead me to keep doing that. Oh, he'll lead me to do something else. Let me tell you what the Lord is not leading you to do. He's not leading you to do nothing, okay? He's not leading you to sit around and watch everybody else work. I guarantee you on a stack of Bibles that the Lord wants all of us doing something, ushering, 
teaching Sunday school, Sunday school helper, bus driver, bus driver helper, kitchen help. Wherever the need is, if you do what's needed to be done, the Lord might lead you to do it. Can I get a witness? <laughs> well, well, this is this is our this is our time. I, I just I just kind of sense it. I just kind of sense that this is the time that the Lord has kind of brought this eclectic group of folk uh, that we have here. And um, I'm praying. I'm asking everyone to really be in prayer about your level of commitment to this local church, uh, your level of commitment in your giving, your level of commitment in the time that you devote to helping, uh, your level of commitment in your praying for the church and promoting and lift up the name of the church um, in your respective life. And I believe if we all do that, that God will bless us, amen, and that God will, will, be, will be pleased. So just consider him in all the things that you do. If you just consider him, I'm confident that most of the time, most of the decisions that you make are going to be the right decisions. Even though it might be hard at the time, but this is the decision that's going to be moving you in the direction that God would have you to move, uh, to be the person that God is uh, moving you to become and having the impact that God wants you to have. Amen? That's where we are. The world needs what we have to offer and we just got to be about doing what is God would have us to do and I think that God God is using us as a church family and I think he desires to use us in a much more great and profound way and let's respond to him today Father we thank you for our time together today it's always a joy